Tell me about hepatocellular jaundice, liver cell disease jaundice. Briefly, you tell the examiner that we, that is divided into two parts, isn't it? Hepatocellular jaundice. That is, there are patients with hepatocellular jaundice, with liver cell disease jaundice, where the hepatocytes, where the liver cell is entirely normal. They still get jaundice. And this is a genetic inborn error metabolism. And though rare, it's extremely common. I suspect if we were to measure the serum by Lerubin of 20 of you watching this morning, there would be a considerable variation. And in some of you, it may be two or three times higher above what we call normal. We call those congenital hyperbilirumenia. And one important group, particularly is young men, is called Gilbert's disease. They come along saying that they are mildly jaundiced. So Mrs. Horn could not be suffering from Gilbert's disease. Worldwide, it is the most commonest cause of jaundice. 5% of normal men have a raised serum bilirubin. But the most important cause of hepatocellular jaundice is some sort of a cellular problem, which can either be acute or chronic, which you might say. And if it's acute, we call it hepatitis. And if it's chronic, we call it cirrhosis. So the examiner may now come up to you and say, well, tell me a little bit about hepatitis and give me an update on the viruses that are involved. You tell the examiner, you're concerned with the inflammation of the liver cell, the hepatocytes. So the five cardinal signs of inflammation are present. Inflammation, gore and carnage and heat and redness and swelling and loss of function and pain. And the viruses that are involved, well we all know about virus A which we used to call ordinary infectious hepatitis, virus B, Virus C, the post-transfusion type hepatitis, the Delta agent, virus D, and the enteric form, virus E. They all exist. They all cause hepatitis. But before I go on telling you about these viruses, I should just perhaps remind you that there are other viruses which can cause hepatitis. And you recall me telling you that when I was talking to you about glandular fever, infectious mononucleosis, the Epstein Barr virus, in which patients can become febrile and jaundice. So let's concentrate on virus A. It hasn't got much relevance to the dentist or the dental therapist. It's a very small spherical particle. 28 nanometers in diameter. Its genome is RNA and it's not even an enveloped virus. Yet, it is extremely stable. How do we know that? Because it can survive seawater, contaminate fish and therefore contaminate us in turn. 65% of patients with virus A are asymptomatic. They don't even know they've had this virus. Is hepatitis A virus serious? Is it harmless or is it harmful? Well, it's harmless long term, though patients at time feel desperately ill, desperately sick. Have you had virus A? Yes. Especially if you're from Africa, 25% of young people have had virus A. And if you're from overseas, that figure is much, much higher. We used to call it ordinary infectious hepatitis. And it's spread by poor hygiene, contamination of food, contamination of water, poor sanitation. How do you know somebody has virus A? 
But you look for the appropriate antibodies, immunoglobulin M antibodies, IgM antibodies, and providing the better, we can leave them alone. Some people get it much more worse than others. So let's now concentrate on virus B. This is a different kettle of fish. All together to that of the virus A is very much relevant to dentists, dental therapists, hygienists, nurses, and doctors. Its genome is DNA, unlike the other hepatitis viruses, which are all genome or RNA. This is a DNA virus. Is hepatitis B virus serious? Yes, it can be. Mortality rate is 10% or so in epidemics, reasonably high, and not can it only produce chronic disease and chronic hepatitis. Some patients can become chronic carriers without contracting the disease, without producing liver disease. Now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the structure of this virus. As I said to you, it's a DNA virus. And if it's a DNA virus, it must have the protein, the polymerase, in order to replicate itself, so it can cause damage and carnage. And indeed, the DNA of the virus and its polymerase, the protein, are in the nuclear capsoid of the virus. That, in turn, is covered by the core antigen. That, in turn, is covered by the little e, the early antigen. And on top of that, we have the surface antigen with these mushroom, spherical-like structures poking out of it. And when the hepatitis B virus invades the body through blood, through body secretions, through body fluids, it doesn't just target any old cell. It has a specificity against specific binding sites on the liver cells, on the hepatocytes, and it latches itself on these binding sites and it enters the hepatocytes via a process known as endocytosis. As soon as the virus is inside the hepatocytes, alarm bells start to ring, we've been invaded, there is an intruder inside. They're not just going to sit back and take this, they're going to send virus-specific cytokines into the bloodstream, little perfumes, little sonic waves, which in turn switches on the T lymphocytes to the liver in order to rescue the situation. This is the acute phase of hepatitis B virus. The T lymphocytes arrive at the liver, but they can't find the virus because the virus is inside the cell. They have got their big heavy hammers. And they can't find the virus, so they start breaking the hepatocytes in order to get to the virus. As soon as the phospholipid cell wall of the hepatocytes is damaged and opened, the content of these hepatocytes are released into the bloodstream. The enzymes, one in particular is alanine amino transferase, ALT, and the other one is aspirate amino transferase, but it is the alanine amino transferase which we can measure and say that this patient is in acute phase of hepatitis B virus. So let's talk about the risk groups. As I said to you, blood and secretions, blood and body fluids, so that Intravenous drug abusers, because of contaminated syringes, because they share syringes. Hemophiliacs, because of factor VIII against syringes. That has stopped now, because we routinely test the blood and the positives are thrown out. Renal dialysis, staff and patients again are at risk because of syringes, because of contaminated items. And if you've been to safari in Africa, and you've gone into labor or you've had a road traffic accident and you've had transfusions, you may contract the hepatitis B virus that way because in Africa they do not routinely test the blood for the hepatitis B virus. And in institutions, mentally handicapped institutions, where hygiene for some reason or other is poor. 
and prostitutions because I've seen man. Homosexual activity, heterosexual activity, any kind of sexual activity where there is an exchange of body fluids, you can contract it that way. It is not a disease of dentists, doctors, nurses and health workers and the chances of you picking it up is very remote. So that blood and haemophilia, blood and renal dialysis, blood and transfusion, blood and dialysis, semen and prostitution, semen and homosexual and heterosexual activity. That is how it all fits together. How do you know somebody has virus B? Well, you look for the surface antigen, the hepatitis B surface antigen. There's something else you look for though. You look for the little e, the early antigen. And why would you do that? Because it tells you whether the patient is infected. So the examiner will come up to you and say, how do you know this patient has virus B and is a danger to you? You say, I look for the surface antigen, the hepatitis B surface antigen, and for infectivity, I look for the little E antigen, the early antigen. So let's now concentrate on the viruses which we call the non-A and B and the first one is C, very similar to virus B in that it has the same risk group and the same complications. Its genome is RNA, even more so because it is reckoned that 50% of patients with virus C go on to develop some sort of chronic disease. Worldwide, it is a very important cause of cirrhosis. Worldwide, it is a very important cause of what we call post-transfusion type hepatitis. Let's not concentrate on the other non-A and B, which we call virus E, the enteric form, its genome is RNA again, and is very similar to virus A, found in Asia and the Far East. So you say to yourself, it's harmless, and indeed it is harmless, unless if the patient is pregnant, but it is anything but. So there are two pairs, very similar to each other. So A and E fit very well together, and B and C fit very well together. So if you remember A, you'll remember E. And if you remember B, you'll remember C. So where does D come in? Well, D stands for the Delta Hepatitis. And the importance of this is that it's an incomplete virus. And it can only exist where another virus exists, and that is with virus B. So you never find virus D by itself, you always find it with B, and if you have a joint infection, that's pretty bad news. It can occur acutely or chronically, that is somebody with virus B and can pick up virus D, and if that happens, as I said to you, this is bad news, you can develop chronic disease much, much more rapidly and you could very well die. Virus B and C are also known for the new plastic complication worldwide of what we call hepatoma, a malignant tumor of the liver cell. Now before I leave you these viruses, just remind you again that other viruses can cause hepatitis, and I was telling you that when I was talking to you about glandular fever, 10 to 20 year olds, they come along, and some of them have got jaundice, and they're febrile. Now, this is acute liver disease. It is perfectly possible to have chronic liver disease, and then usually we're dealing with a disease called cirrhosis. Have you seen cirrhotic livers? But there is a slide of a cirrhotic liver. From an autopsy, you can see the liver is pale, nodular, and this is certainly due to alcohol. And the army service and the tattoos and all these things all suggest the same thing. There is a slide from another cirrhotic liver, but the nodules are big like that. And we've discussed the possible etiology of that iris either previous virus B or C. And if I were to tell you, 
that this patient has had a road traffic accident and has had many, many transfusions. Which one do you think it would be? Yes, virus C, because you know we routinely test the blood for virus B and positives are thrown out. Whereas we have not got a satisfactory 100% test for the virus C. Worldwide, virus C is important cause of what we call post-transfusion type hepatitis. Usually in the old days it was virus B and C, but these days it is virus C.